At the turn of the 20th century in Dayton, Ohio, Hawthorne Street looked much as it does today. Men and women are still living who remember how in the years 1900, 1901, 1902, 1903, the quiet, slow-spoken Wright brothers came walking down Hawthorne, back again from their journeys to Kitty Hawk. And how, with that bent, alert, probing way of theirs, they strode past the homes of Vance the harness maker, Pahu the stone cutter, Wellborn the wagon maker, Wolfram the carriage trimmer. Year after year, they came quietly home to number seven Hawthorne Street. But once within the house, reserve left them. With their father, Bishop Milton Wright, their sister Catherine, or the young girl, Carrie Grumbach, listening unobtrusively, the Wright brothers studied aloud, discussed exhaustively, argued in detail, and at last conceived the principles that were to open the skies to the navigation of men. Around the corner from Hawthorne on 4th Street, Orville and Wilbur Wright tested not only their ideas, but they examined the theories of other men who had explored the possibilities of flight. Cayley, Lilienthal, Chanute, Langley. The Wrights devised methods of measuring the accuracy of aeronautical theories, including their own. The home was their discussion hall, the shop, their laboratory. Both today are gone from Dayton, moved as monuments to the Wright memory to the museum at Greenfield Village in Dearborn. Discussion hall, laboratory, and testing devices such as their first wind tunnel had their plates. But the Wrights at once had recognized an axiom of aviation that still endures. Proof must come in the air. On this windswept beach in 1900, 1901, and 1902, they tested gliders they had built. They taught themselves to be pilots of a high order. They were critical men, but at last, their 1902 model pleased them. They flew it farther and with better control than any other glider that man had ever devised. They came back from Kitty Hawk in 1902 with a knowledge that they had solved flight's paramount secret, control. And in the spring of 1903, they designed a four-cylinder engine and fashioned two propellers. When they next went to Kitty Hawk, they flew. On December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made man's first four controlled flights in a powered airplane. That day, they lifted the world into a new dimension. What the Wrights had achieved at Kitty Hawk barely evoked passing attention in a nation whose people were absorbed with the problems of a dynamic new age. There were other less celestial wonders closer at hand. The automobile, the telephone, the motion picture, but at number seven Hawthorne Street, December 17, 1903 was a momentous day. The young girl who was then the Wright's housekeeper, Carrie Grumbach, remembers. I remember the telegram when it come, that they had flown, that they had done what they said they would do. They always did as they had planned. The telegram from Kitty Hawk had a special significance for the mechanic who worked in the Wright's bicycle shop, Charlie Taylor. Of course, I was greatly pleased to know that it had been accomplished, but at that time it didn't seem to be anything wonderful. At that's that. Uh, I started on repairing bicycles back in, uh, in the 80s. And then I later went to Dayton and built bicycles for the Stoddard Manufacturing Company. And they were just starting up in the bicycle business. Then I, I got acquainted with the Wrights and I would built bicycles for them. I did all the repair work while they went down Kitty Hawk to try out their gliders. Well, and all they needed was power to keep on flying. Why then, when we designed the motor, I made all the different parts in the, in the motor. I even made the crankshaft. So I made it out of a solid block of steel, about 32 inches long, six inches wide, and inch and five-eighths thick. <laughs> 
cut it right out of the solid block by drilling holes and knocking out large pieces out of it and then uh, then turning it up in the lathe. The motor itself, from the time I started, well, I had it ready for test, was six weeks. Fifty years ago, I can remember as though it was yesterday almost. There was not a complete indifference to the Wright's discovery. A small group of Americans were laboring to further the art. And in Europe, where the airplane's military potential was quickly realized, a fresh wave of enthusiasm for aviation followed the Wright's success. In France, Blériot, Farman and Briquet were flying airplanes of their own design. The Englishman Curie and the Brazilian Santos Dumont, most of whose experiments took place in France, also captured the imagination of Europe with successful flights. The Wrights had offered to demonstrate their airplane to the United States Army shortly after their first successful flights. The Army declined, preferring to develop its small fleet of balloons as an air arm. Oddly, it was a young balloonist lieutenant of the Army who finally was instrumental in obtaining a chance for the Wrights and their airplane, Frank P. Long. After four long years of failing to recognize the Wrights, Finally, in December of 1907, the Board of Ordnance and Fortification granted the interview to Wilbur. At once, he inspired their confidence. This led to a contract in February of 1908 between the Wright brothers and the Signal Corps, in which they agreed to furnish an airplane that would fly 40 miles an hour, carry two persons, remain in the air for one hour, and, strange to relate, was to have some kind of a device by which, in case the motor stopped, it could be landed without crashing. In the summer of 1908, Orville Wright brought to Fort Myer, Virginia, the airplane that was to fulfill their specifications of the contract. Day after day, we watched him go fly around and around the field in his tuning up flights. And finally, on the 9th of September, he broke the world record by staying in the air for over one hour. On landing, he came to me and said, would you like to go up? You can guess my answer. And I made my first flight in the airplane that day with Orville Wright, six minutes and 40 seconds. Lieutenant Law became the first military officer ever to fly in an airplane. Eight days later, tragedy struck. On a flight at Fort Myer, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge was killed. Orville Wright injured. Shocked, but not deterred, both the Army and the Wrights moved to improve the airplane. In the summer of 1909, both Wilbur and Orville Wright came to Fort Myer, this time with a new airplane. It fulfilled the specifications, including an hour's flight, in which it was my good fortune to ride with Orville for an hour and 12 minutes. Another young Army lieutenant, Benjamin Folloy, had a chance to fly in the Wright plane at Fort Myer. On the day following the endurance uh, test with Orville Wright and uh, Lieutenant Lahm, uh, Orville, with a quiet little grin on his face, uh, invited me to be his guest on the uh, crucial and final cross-country and speed tests. The grin on Orville's face was for my benefit, particularly as I'd been responsible for laying out the course between Port Myer and Alexandria, Virginia, and there was not a landing field on the entire out, uh, out or bow, homebound course except Fort Myer drill ground. On July 30th, we took off on the uh, final cross country and speed test. Shortly after we straightened out on the course for Alexandria, Orville with this same little grin on his face told me that uh, if he had to land anywhere on the route, and he'd pick out the thickest clump of trees he could find and land on top of them. Fortunately, the little engine that we had at the time carried us all the way through without any difficulty. And we finally landed back at Fort Myer drill ground with three world records, cross country, 10 miles, altitude 600 feet, and speed 42 and a half miles an hour. The United States Army had an airplane. The need now was for pilots. There in the fall of 1909, under Wilbur Wright's instruction, a Lieutenant F.P. E. Humphrey of U.S. engineers and myself were taught to fly and at the end of some three hours were soloed 
and told we were pilots. So in 1909, the military airplane was mated to the military pilot. Meanwhile, all over the world, aviation pioneers, encouraged by the Wright brothers' flights, were hard at work. The principles of flight were now widely known, and designers were applying them to many types of aircraft. Glenn Curtis, Glenn Martin, and the Canadian J.A.D. McCurdy were designing and flying airplanes in competition and for exhibition. In Europe, the airplanes of Blériot, Pollum, Farman, and de Havilland were demonstrating obvious advances in both speed and range. And in Russia, Igor Sikorsky was taking his first steps into the age of flight. And I remember very, very well the early um, interesting period in France in 1909 and 1910 when the very first attempts were made to push aviation from the purely original experimental flying to some kind of successful practical achievement. I have seen Bradio coming in the same factory to purchase his motor on which a few months later he crossed the English Channel. At that time, I had my share of uh, failures with the first helicopter, which was a fine machine, only it couldn't fly. Glenn Martin remembers an episode of his pioneering days. I've just been reading an old postcard sent by our family doctor to my mother Dated September 30th, 1910. This is at a time when I just began to leave the ground in a flying machine. <clears throat> and it says, for heaven's sake, if you have any influence with that wild-eyed, hallucinated young man, call him off before he is killed. Uh, have him devote his energies to substantial, feasible, and profitable pursuits, leaving dreaming to the professional dreamers. For a dreamer, Glenn Martin was attracting a remarkable group of clear-thinking young designers as workmen. The first to join him was Donald Douglas. I guess it must be getting old, because somehow it becomes fun to reminisce. Well, my first memory of things in aviation was seeing First Wright airplane demonstrated for the Signal Corps in 1908 at uh, Fort Myers outside of Washington. So I took the street car and one thing and another and got out to Fort Myers. Well, there she was as I had seen her pictured, the old Wright pusher. And there were Wilbur and Orville. And there was that old launching device that kind of looked like a guillotine and they had the airplane perched up at the starting part of the track and the weight all ready to go. And I remember well, I believe it was Wilbur, going out and holding up a bit of dust and dropping it to see that there wasn't a bit of wind. And then as I recall, it was Wilbur that got into the machine with, I guess it was Colonel Lom. And they pulled the old latch and down this little wooden track it went with those funny old props batting around at apparently a pretty slow speed and off she went. One of the first pilots was Roy Nobinshoe, who was a balloonist even before he became an airplane pilot. This gentleman, I'm pointing out, right back of the pilot, was Walter Brookins. Walter was a, a great pilot. His uh, judgment was uncanny, but he was very temperamental. As a matter of fact, he, uh, Arch Hoxie, and Ralph Johnson was the three best pilots that the Wright Company had, and each one tried to outdo the other. My friend Dick Ferris remarked to me one time, he said, I uh, have been an impresario. I've handled actors and prima donnas. But he says, these aviators start in where the other fellow leaves off. And he says, it's impossible to do anything with them. The ambitions of some designers went far beyond their skills. As Igor Sikorsky has said, In the history of aviation, there have been many contraptions which, to the good fortune of their inventors, failed to fly. 
Inventors of a high skill sometimes were deadly serious in demonstrating the utility man could expect from the airplane. Lawrence Sperry, whose contributions to the aircraft instrument field were momentous, puts a pre-war aircraft through its paces. All this ferment, however often it seemed to lack direction, was contributing in one way or another to the growth of aviation. The airplane was growing cleaner in design. Its horsepower was more dependable. The disparaging term aeronaut was giving way to aviator, a term of respect. Aviation was emerging as a science. A pioneer aeronautical engineer and educator, Dr. Jerome Hunsacker. Professional education in aeronautical engineering began in this country at MIT in the winter of 1913-14. This course was started by President McLaurin borrowing me from the Navy Department and supplying me with one assistant as staff who was a recent graduate in mechanical engineering, Donald Douglas, from whom more was to be heard. The pusher engine of early planes had been replaced by the tractor engine installations which allowed higher speeds. The Wrights were foreseeing these helpful aircraft devices and other inventors such as Elmer Sperry were inventing and refining them. Here, a Curtis seaplane flies with the early Sperry automatic pilot. Almost without exception in the first decade of the airplane, the designers were pilots. They built, tested, and flew their own designs. Wrights, Blériot, Santos Dumont, Curtis, Rowe, Sikorsky, de Havilland, and Martin. At Glen Martin's, a band of engineers and craftsmen had gathered together whose names and time would be synonymous with aircraft designs of world rank. Donald Douglas, James H. Dutch Kindleberger, Lawrence Larry Bell, Alan Lockheed, John Northrop. The United States was the cradle of flight. Inventors of a high order had appeared. Our pilots were unmatched. First-rate designers emerged. Brilliant men specialized in the components of the airplane. But as a pioneer who specialized in aircraft horsepower, Frederick B. Rentschler summarizes. Prior to World War I, our most important contribution to aviation was the flight of the Wright brothers. From December 1909 to March 1911, 13 months, the entire United States Air Force consisted of one officer, myself, uh, one civilian mechanic, Eight enlisted men, one aeroplane. The government at that time wasn't very keen about turning money loose for flying. I had uh, the great appropriation of $150 allotted to me to take care of the aeroplane for the entire year 1910. January 1910, Chief Signal Officer directed me to proceed to support Sam Houston, Texas, to teach myself how to fly. On March 2nd, I made four flights, three good and one bad. The last one, I cracked up and put the plane in the shop for about 10 days. After each crack up, I used to sit down and try to puzzle out what had happened. Then I'd write to the Wright brothers and tell them all that I thought had happened. They'd proceed to write back and tell me what I ought to have done. In other words, I expect that I'm about the only man living today who learned to fly by correspondence. Two air-minded young lieutenants shortly joined General Folloy, the one-man Air Force. They were Hap Arnold and T. DeWitt Milling. Looking back 42 years ago to March 1911, the month in, the, the in which General Arnold and myself were ordered to Dayton to learn to fly with the Wright brothers, and to think of the plane that we used at that time and see the advance that has been made since, it seems incomprehensible that one man in his own lifetime could live through such progress. After our very brief period of instruction of about a week, two to three hours in order to learn to fly, we were sent to College Park, Maryland. We immediately started in to try to find some method 
by which we could develop from the standpoint of taking photographs, using the machine gun, dropping bombs. The air arm of the United States Navy began under equally apathetic circumstances. Naval aviator number three was Admiral John H. Towers. In the autumn of 1911, when I was quite a young naval officer serving aboard one of our battleships, I got the idea that I wanted to learn to fly, that naval aviation would amount to something for naval purposes. So I put in a request to the Navy Department, and they came back and quite frankly said that they didn't believe aviation would ever amount to anything. But if it turned out to be otherwise, uh, they would consider my request. During that winter, uh, Congress uh, appropriated money for the Navy to buy three airplanes. So they were in it whether or not they wanted to be. And uh, then they decided to select three officers to be taught to fly as part of the contract with the manufacturers of the airplanes. I was fortunate enough to be one of those three officers. The other two were Ellison and Rogers. I also became a very close friend of Glenn Curtis and uh, was associated with him throughout his whole life. The man had an enormous amount of vision. He had already conducted, in cooperation with the Navy, tests of uh, landing an airplane on a platform, on a cruiser, and also of taking off. But he had in his mind then the idea which later developed into the powerful carriers that we have today. The airplane now had official recognition, both from the Army and the Navy, but it was a cautious acceptance. The time-forged armament still held sway. When the fledgling Army flyers experimented with a primitive bomb sight and a Lewis machine gun installed in aircraft at College Park, Maryland, they landed and foresaw whole battles that someday might be fought in the air. The War Department promptly pierced that bubble. An official spokesman pointed out with finality that the Army had airplanes for just one purpose, reconnaissance. From a pistol shot at Sarajevo, the first of the great modern world wars exploded. And almost overnight, all of Europe was engulfed in conflict. Once the great armies had met head on, the conflict resolved itself into a desperate struggle to hold this plot of ground, this foot of earth. Military analysts called it positional warfare. But the foot soldiers knew it only as a war of trenches, a desperate fight for a waterlogged hole. Automotive power began to supplement the feeding, supplying, and tending of troops burrowed in the earth. The tank made its combat appearance. But for many months, the First World War remained an earthbound conflict. The airplane was put to work, just as the U.S. War Department spokesman had prophesied, as observation and scouting craft. The source of peril lay in the artillery, machine gun, and rifle fire, scourging the entrenched troops from across the wasted land. But in the air, Allied and German pilots often waved to each other as they passed on their observation missions. Then, instead of the courteous wave, the opposing pilots began exchanging pistol fire. Presently, the first crudely mounted machine guns appeared. Now, the frantic race of inventing, improvising, adapting, and refining aircraft equipment began. Quickly, the Germans countered the hand-operated machine gun by installing upon their aircraft the invention of Tony Fokker, a machine gun synchronized to fire through the aircraft propeller. A paramount lesson that the Allies were to remember a generation later was being learned in air warfare for the first time. No design capable of still further development could be frozen. And countermeasures must be met by counter-countermeasures. <laughs> 
It was becoming clear that no nation or race had a corner on inventive skill. While the single-engined airplane had been engrossing most designers, in Russia, Igor Sikorsky... In 1912, I decided that the time came to build a large machine with several motors. At that time, I was certain already that the future of aviation will be connected with fairly large aircraft, that the closed cabin with its comfort, protection from wind and so forth represent a must. In 13, I completed my first uh, four motor aeroplane, <coughs> the Grand. The ship proved a complete success. It flew quite well. It the Grand's military successor, the Ilya Mormets, was the first four-engine bomber in world history. It struck time after time at the Central Powers on the Eastern Front. The internal combustion engine now became an instrument of intensive technical development. The first successful engine had not been developed until 1860. One of the world's foremost engine designers, Leonard S. Hobbs, recollects its history. It starts out actually with a little known Frenchman by the name of Lenoir, who has never gotten the credit he deserved. He built and actually marketed the first internal combustion engine, and it was from his engine that the Wright brothers were able to build one. Of course, the early pre-war power plants are fairly well known, the Anzanis and the Curtis OXs. The First World War did mark a great advance in power plants. First, there were the rotaries, the clergies, the gnome rooms. Then there was the Renault engine, which was a very good French engine. The British RAF engines. Toward the end of the war came the very beginning of what I think is the is the modern engine. First, there was the Hispano uh, Suiza with its solid block and uh, a valve arrangement, which is, is uh, standard in a lot of engines to this day. Also, out of the First World War came the, a, a remarkable German effort, the BMW. Now, this engine is the first engine that I know of in all history that attempted to overcome the effects of altitude on power. in which European antagonists had been tempered by three years of savage battle, whose equipment had been perfected by the necessity of survival without regard to cost, the United States now plunged. It was the world's 14th ranking air power with only 28 airplanes, 65 pilots, supplemented by 50 flying students. Its Navy combat air arm was even smaller. Its industry lacked integration. The nation that had allotted Benny Falloy $150 in 1910 for maintenance of that year's Air Force promptly voted $600 million to fulfill a plea by the Allies to have 5,000 airplanes and 4,500 pilots on the Western Front by the spring of 1918. When we entered the war, the country knew that the United States already had an industrial capacity double that of Great Britain, France, and Germany combined. We quickly realized that to supplement the meager aeronautical developments resulting from years of federal indifference to air power, we had to obtain licenses for the production of proved British and French airplanes and aircraft engines in our new factories. Our national mistake was the assumption that an instrument as dynamic as the airplane could be designed, tested, and developed overnight. Thousands of rookie pilots training in the United States and in England and France had an inspiring example of American air combat performance through the brilliant exploits of the Lafayette Escadrille, a team of American volunteers who had joined the Allied cause in 1916. But American performance had its hours of frustration. One of the first young pilots to see action in France with the 1st Aero Squadron was Oliver P. Eccles. We'd been equipped with a new type of French airplane with a new and very much improved engines. These airplanes were assigned to us. The squadron had the strength of 18 airplanes. And we were assigned the mission of supporting uh, one of the American divisions one afternoon in the attack. Our airplanes took off 18 strong. During the afternoon, 
all of the airplanes force landed from engine failure. Fortunately, none of them behind the enemy line. But out of the 18 airplanes that went out, none of them got back. The pilots of World War I made the term dogfight synonymous with their work. America's top ace, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker of the famed 94th Hat in Ring Squadron, reflects on the different approaches to combat of the pilots of World War I and the pilots of today. That individualism uh, was possible because the planes were much slower. You'd stay in maneuver. Whereas today, it's impossible because of the tremendous speed, the difference of 100 miles an hour and six, seven, and six or 700 miles an hour. We had 150 horsepower. Today, if they haven't got five or 6,000 horsepower, it's no good. We had two little pop guns, 30 caliber, that would shoot sometimes 450 rounds a minute. Today, they've got six and eight 50 caliber guns that'll shoot 1,000 rounds a minute with a couple of cannon thrown in, 20 millimeter or 37 millimeter cannon, and then maybe a half a dozen or a dozen rockets that uh, I have terrific destructive power, all of which means that today the time element is so limited for a pilot in combat with an enemy that it's a matter of a fraction of a second. Today he has a cockpit full of instruments and gadgets. It's pressurized, he's air conditioned. We had a gasoline gauge, an oil gauge. We had a tachometer or a revolution counter Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, and the fourth instrument was an aldometer that we could never rely on. The Navy's pre-war requests for funds to build up its air arm had been denied, and only a skeleton Naval Air Force existed. A naval officer whose career has bridged two wars in aeronautics, Admiral DeWitt C. Ramsey. From the outset, the Navy's problem has been to bring aircraft into the mobile operating forces of the fleet. We may say that this had its start in World War I and post the post-World War I period when kite balloons were used from battleships and auxiliaries for gunfire spotting and tactical reconnaissance. The equipment was very cumbersome and as hydrogen was used as the lifting gas for the balloons, we found that it was not a satisfactory measure of doing a naval job. So they were abandoned after a short, relatively short trial. The real beginning of naval aviation, let us say, took place in England, where during World War I, the latter part of it, the British converted two ships the Furious and the Argus, and built into them the features which were desirable for aircraft launching and recovery. Uh, I happened to have been in England at about that period and kept our Navy Department informed of the progress of the British in this field. As a result, the Navy embarked on an initial program of converting the old Collier Jupiter into our first flat top, the Langley. In 1918, as the war began to move toward its climax, American aircraft equipment still had not entered combat. An intensive effort was being made to perfect the Liberty engine. Before the Liberty or any other aerial product of the United States designing boards could be put in action, the final critical offensive of World War I had begun. Millions of men pulled out of trenches to attack or retreat. Above them, to be sure, planes flew in bombing and strafing missions. Individual pilots whose names became legendary met in dogfights. Germany's von Richthofen, France's Fonck, Canada's Bishop, Germany's Goering, and such American aces as Rickenbacker, Luke, Loughberry, Vaughan, Springs, Kindley, Landis, Swab, Hunter. 
retrospect, it might be said that aviation itself has served a very small part in the result of the World War I conflict. However, it did prove itself. That is, it, it was easy to recognize that with proper equipment, at another later time, aviation might become a real instrument of military warfare. After the war was over, a great many of American boys had been taught to fly, but they didn't get to the front. Of course, after the war was over, they had nothing to do, and there were a great many surplus airplanes. And that is the period when you hear so much about of the days of barnstorming. After the war, with all these surplus airplanes, a lot of the fellows who had been taught to fly then decided to go out and carry passengers and do stunts and regular exhibition flying, principally at county fairs and state fairs and things of that sort. Both the Army and Navy Air Arms shortly were reduced once again to organizations hardly larger than the membership of a civic club. Yet in both services, the men who remained were uniquely zealous advocates of their calling. Almost to a man, they realized they had only begun to explore the capacities that the airplane offered in size, speed, range, and altitude performance. A decade was dawning in American history that was to be known flippantly as the era of wonderful nonsense. Beneath its surface corruption, its wild enthusiasms, and its extravagant posturing, history now has found that it was a time in which men in many fields of the arts and sciences were employing immense physical energy to attain goals of a sober worth. Aviation had its share of such men. The accomplishments of the 20s were presaged in 1919 by man's first flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The NC-4, a large flying boat whose development had begun during the war, was chosen, as the Navy's pioneer pilot Admiral Towers points out, for the ambitious task. When the war was over, the first one was just about completed. So I proposed to the Navy Department that we go ahead the following spring and uh, with as many of these aircraft as could be built by that time, let the Navy undertake to be the first to fly the Atlantic. Luckily for me, I was selected to command that expedition. It's all history now. Two of the three airplanes uh, landing at sea in very rough water were so damaged they couldn't make it, but the NC-4 made it from Newfoundland to the Azores to Lisbon. Army pilots already had inaugurated airmail service on May 15, 1918, a service that had been under discussion since 1910. William Boeing, who had entered aviation in 1916, was instrumental in starting the first international airmail service on the North American continent. In 1919, Eddie Hubbard and I took a flight up to Vancouver, B.C. On our return trip, the postmaster at Vancouver handed us a mail sack for delivery to the postmaster at Seattle. This was the first international mail ever carried by plane into the United States. What real utilities the airplane actually offered were overshadowed in the public eye by its use as a spectacular stunting device throughout the pastures and primitive flying fields of the country. The Jenny could be bought for as little as $50, and men who had flying in their blood preferred to scramble for the few dollars they could make risking their lives in exhibition flying rather than seeking out pedestrian jobs. As one of them, Dick DePew, cheerfully said, the greatest hazard in flying is the risk of starving to death. Abruptly, the country's attention concentrated on a single man with a single theme. Brigadier General William Mitchell, who had had a distinguished war record, argued that the Mahan doctrine of sea power had been outmoded by the airplane and pleaded for a separate national air arm. He contended, in seeking a $60 million appropriation for Army Air Services, or about half the cost of a single battleship, that the United States could begin developing an air force which could hold mastery of both the air and the seas. Larry Bell was still with Glenn Martin when, 
That resulted in Congress bringing about a test wherein one of the targets that we were supposed to sink or try to sink was the famous Oster Friesland, the pride of the German Navy, which we had captured. This ship was anchored about 100 miles offshore, and six of the Martin bombers went out, each carrying a 2,000-pound bomb. They paraded over the battleship, and they dropped the six bombs, and only one hit it, and that was by mistake. The rest were timed to detonate at 100 feet below the surface, and it practically exploded the Oster Friesland. At least it ripped the bottom of the ship from bow to stern, and the ship sank in four minutes. The Navy had already begun systematically to broaden the scope of its Bureau of Aeronautics. Many of its men, whose views of the need for air power were not as vehement as Billy Mitchell's, nevertheless already had envisioned carriers as the heart of future striking forces. Admiral Ramsey was the navigator of the Navy's first flat top, the Langley. The Langley had at best 14 knots maximum speed, and that's all the wind speed she could generate and manufacture, so we had to wait for adequate wind conditions to perform flight operations. The nation's first large aircraft carriers, the Saratoga and the Lexington, were designed and were being built. These great ships, developing uh, approximately 180,000 horsepower, manufactured all of the wind that was needed in the absence of a surface wind for flight operations. The nation accepted the airplane and tacitly agreed with its advocates, but there was still no federal provision for long-range planning and procurement. Nevertheless, a core of designers and manufacturers stayed with the business. In the ceaseless drive to attain longer range and more reliable performance, the airplane, its engine, its components, and its instruments steadily were growing more complex. But the primary goal was speed. Roscoe Turner. I have maintained ever since that I've been flying that there's only one reason for flying, and that is speed. It's 1910 Curtis, 49 miles an hour. 1910 White, 61 miles an hour. 1911 Wyman, 78 miles an hour. 1920 Mosley, 156 miles an hour. Mon, in 19 22, 206 miles an hour. And 19 and 25, Doolittle, 232 miles an hour. Jimmy Doolittle, a hell for leather pilot, whose own cold judgment was that he was essentially a technician. These record flights have a very real meaning. Competition has perhaps always been the greatest stimulus to improvement. And out of this competition, came improvements, improvements that were improvements in the performance of aircraft and the safety of aircraft, and those improvements were immediately applicable to the military and indirectly applicable to commercial aviation. The ferment of the early 20s brought forth men who combined technical gifts with a skill of organization. A few such men, like Chance Vaught, had formed their own companies and built successful airplanes. Others had served their apprenticeship with aviation's early pioneers, but now they were branching out on their own. Dutch Kindleberger recollects a small episode that launched an enduring company. Even in the 35 years that I've been messing with it myself, there have been vast changes, particularly technically. I can remember very distinctly when at the Martin Company in 1920, Don Douglas, who was then the chief engineer, left to come out to California to start his own business. I helped him pack. We packed up from his office about, oh, two ordinary condensed milk cartons full of data. In those two cartons, we put everything that was known and printed, and some of it wrong, about the science of aviation engineering. Today, you couldn't pack into this room the index of such technical information, let alone the subject matter. The machine began to get complicated, and from there on came the specialists. A great many great men have contributed to aviation purely as specialists. Sperry, one of the greatest. Colonel Clark, who devised one of the first good airfoils. Sam Heron came along on his cylinders and his fuel 
and then Frank Mark with his carburation devices and later fuel injection. Frank Caldwell with his propeller. Our earliest propellers were all wooden propellers, uh, but they had several shortcomings. They were subject to atmospheric troubles and they twisted out of shape in various climates. And uh, they were also quite thick so that at the high speed at which propeller tips operated, they were losing efficiency. Uh, one of the uh, things which we did to overcome this was to develop a metal propeller, uh, which first was a drop forged aluminum alloy blade. Uh, being very much thinner than the wooden ones, the efficiency was maintained in better condition, and also they were quite stable in various atmospheric conditions. Sam Heron began working on aircraft engines as early as 1909 and shortly went to the Royal Aircraft Factory in England. I came to this country in 1921 and for the next five years was engaged in air-cooled cylinder development. It was really the air-cooled engine that made fuel development so necessary. The first move was to put tetraethyl lead in the existing gasoline. Later the Air Force got the idea of adding the component uh, that has the high, uh, the high end of the octane scale to the gasoline, and that eventually led to 100 octane gasoline. Frank Mock, the carburation and fuel control specialist. Our carburation work has always had to be a good bit like that of the Wright brothers, in the respect that we could get a little guide from a textbook. The automobile carburetor, of course, was designed to operate on the level. The aircraft car betters have to climb, dive, even fly upside down. Also, they have to go up an altitude where the air is thin. Mock, Hobbs, Sperry, Clark, Caldwell, Heron. The singular devotion with which these men and scores of other specialists pursued their particular fields leads H.M. Jack Horner, whose own specialty of aircraft production combined the fruits of all their labors, to say, That heritage of research development, the background work that goes into aircraft has continued throughout the whole existence of aircraft and the great improvements that have come there too. After that, with flight becoming a little bit more common, I think it's important to realize the fervor with which those individuals did carry on their work. It was a passion with them. Then, midway in the 20s, came two events that turned the course of American aviation sharply upward. First, the government adopted the recommendations of President Coolidge's Morrow Board. These called for a sustained aircraft procurement program built on the foundation of a privately operated and technically competitive aircraft industry. Although both military airmen and technologists were convinced that the airplane long before had outgrown its function as a scout, the bulk of our aircraft still consisted of observation planes. Now, new, more powerful engines began to emerge for advanced aircraft, which both services had developed. The nation moved rapidly from a third-rate air power to international leadership. 